Morning, everybody. Um, it's Andrew Knight here from uh, RICS. Uh, I lead the RICS Tech Partner Program. Uh, I've been with RICS for over 10 years now, working in the Standards Regulation and uh, Thought Leadership uh, Directorate. Uh, and I'm really pleased this morning to, to have a conversation with uh, Stuart Little of IRT Survey. So, so welcome, Stuart. Thank you very much, Andrew. Great to have you on board today. And uh, I'd like to kick off, I guess, with uh, perhaps an introduction from your side, really a, a, a bit of a backstory on uh, why IRT, IRT Surveys was created and the kind of experience and skills and knowledge of the team that you've, you've got and built. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a long question, that one, Andrew. <laughs> I, could talk, I could talk on that one for about an hour and a half. <laughs> um, we were founded, um, Cracky, just coming up for 20 years ago. And I'll share my screen with you so you can see yeah, um, sure. who we are and what we do, if that's okay. Uh, so we, we, we've been around for nearly 20 years. Our team uh, is uh, started with my brother and I, uh, who you can see holding our, our one and only Vibes Award back in 2015. <laughs> I think we won that. But we, we started with investment from a chap called Dave Jones, who wrote Grand Theft Auto, he wrote Lemmings, he wrote Crackdown, he wrote David Beckham Soccer, and won a couple of BAFTAs for his work in computer software. Dave's been a friend since I was about 15, Andrew. Um, today we've got Paul Hallis, who's ex-Centrica, we've got a venture capitalist uh, called Shackleton, we've got Philip Selwood, who's ex-CEO of Energy Saving Trust, and Jenny Danson, who is ex-social um, housing mainly. And we've just been going for 19 years, predominantly doing thermal imaging surveys and buildings uh, and uh, net zero software. But what we started in was flat roofing. My background was architectural. Yeah. Uh, I used to used to design buildings as a technician. Was made redundant when I was 21. Ended up selling flat roofs and roof gardens for a company called Bowder. And it was working for Bowder that I had the the initial idea to say, look, let's go and do thermal imaging. And instead of cutting holes in roofs and doing destructive testing, was there a high tech way of doing it with thermal imaging where I could photograph the truth? Uh, not that Bowder were dishonest, it's just you could only ever glean as much as you could from a core sample. Mm. And a thermal image could actually say, look, you've got exactly 17.6 square meters of wet insulation on the roof, and it came from that aircon unit, and here's how to remedy it. So that, that was the catalyst, and it kind of has grown arms and legs ever since, to the point that we've done something like 350,000 um, social house surveys now. Uh, and uh, as you see on the screen, we've got about half a million houses on our uh, cloud-based software, and we've done various bits and bobs for, for quite a few housing associations up and down the country. Um, do, would That's you like great. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I, I was going to sort of bring up the fact that, that you and I first sort of met in in this virtual world of, of Teams and Zoom because I chair the uh, the data working group for the the Coalition for Energy Efficient Buildings, part of the Green Finance Institute. And it'd be interesting to hear your perception of uh, obviously you're involved in that in, in that particular work, but this this need across the UK in terms of retrofit, could, could you give sort of your perception of of the scale of that challenge and and obviously how your work fits into that? Sure. Yeah, the, the, it's a massive challenge. I mean, there are 28 million homes, uh, and an awful lot of them need retrofit uh, of, of some description. So a lot of focus has been on the the lowest hanging fruit, the people that can have free measures in fuel poor areas, or the people that are in EF and G rated homes. But there's a real challenge. There are only about four and a half million social homes. There are about four and a half million uh, private rented homes, and there are about 18 million owner occupied. Mm. So the private rented sector is it's very difficult to get hold of because most people own maybe two or three houses in that space. So the focus for most commercial companies has been on local authorities and housing associations because it's one customer with say 10, 20, 30,000 houses. So in some ways that's easier than the private rented, but private rented is easier than the owner occupier. When you think about how do you engage with 18 million individuals, but the big challenge, the reason we met Andrew, the reason we joined the GFI, is they reckon the challenge is about a £65 billion challenge in the next 10 years, to try and hit net zero. And we, we've always perceived it as a, a journey like any other. And, and before you embark on any journey, the first thing you need to do is establish where you are, and then agree a destination, and then plan the nearest route. 
So we basically embarked on a, a software mission to say, look, could we, could we curate data and then augment it, sanitize it, run it through today's legislation, and then present it back to people in a meaningful way? Because data, data is only data. It needs to be turned into information. Otherwise, it's just data that sits there. Um, so that, that's what we did. We, we, we just went on this journey to say, look, thermal images are quite compelling. They're quite uh, cool. But could you turn it into something actionable and demonstrable? Uh, and we use them to prove efficacy of the actual retrofit uh, journey that we do. So as a, as a for instance, we, we started a really cool project in Glasgow that began with me watching someone doing a, a presentation in the Scottish Parliament. And they, they said, look, we'd like to roll out electric vehicle charging through lampposts in Glasgow, but there isn't enough headroom. There's insufficient headroom in the national grid mm. for people to be able to drive home from work, plug in a car, go upstairs, switch on the oven, put the TV on and boil the kettle. The, the yeah. national grid, <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a fundamental thing, but the national grid gets within about 5% of falling over several times throughout any given year. So we, we basically pitched the council and said, look, if we can show you how to make the buildings more efficient, would that be of interest and help you roll out the vehicle chargers? And uh, you know what surveyors are like, Andrew, very well. The minute you say, look, we're going to put drones in the sky and take high resolution images, everyone got all excited and said things like, oh, that's quite cool. Could you count how many broken slates there are? <laughs> Someone else said, could you count how many linear meters of lead have been stolen? Yeah. Someone else said, could you tell us the state of the chimneys? Someone else said, could you tell us how many bolts are holding on the satellite dishes? Yeah. Um, so it, it grew arms and legs. It really, but it, it was a really cool project. It was 500 tenements, all the roofs, all the walls. It was about 600 hours of flying the drones without incident in Nicola Sturgeon's uh, literal constituency. And what, what the council in Glasgow did was basically survey all these tenements and then say to the, the owners of the tenements, because these were all owner-occupied buildings, say to them, look, here are all the things you need to do. If you do it, we can grant fund the repairs by the tune of, to the tune of 50% if you do it within the next 12 months. And if you don't, there'll be no grant funding. Hmm. It, was a, it was a bit of a carrot and stick approach. Yeah. But that, that's, it's a good example of, of how you get that data into actionable results. Andrew, you know, it's, it's really important that people, they don't just sit on data. It has to be meaningful. So how did you turn that, that, that visual data into kind of structured actionable data? How, do, how did that piece work? <laughs> that, that bit was easier. That bit was easier than getting the health and safety uh, and the procurement process done. Yeah. We basically took uh, lots of very high resolution visual images, lots of high res thermal images, um, matched them together, put it into uh, our software, monetized all the images so we could actually tell you how much money carbon and kilowatts was being lost from each photograph, but then embedded it into a, a basically an interactive report where you could go down the street, click on a building, pull up the building, and then interrogate it. Um, but it, it, it did take everyone in our company about five months. It was a big endeavor. And you talk about things like I see there on the slide that, you know, the cracks, the cracked slates counted. Were you using that kind of um, visual recognition software to, to actually look at objects and, 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 and understand the kind of objects it was seeing? I would love to say there was an element of AI involved in that, Andrew, but some of it was just old school, look, zoom in. So we, we had yeah, the... Yeah. The visual images we had were so high resolution that you could zoom in on one slate and it would fill a 32 inch monitor mm. and you could see a 10 millimeter crack in it and we just we just couldn't have any ai software that was as good as an experienced surveyor as an eyeball yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah that, so it was a bit, a bit old school and some super high tech in one yeah. element and then a bit old school in the other so what was the next step what happened from that well, the, the unfortunate bit about that project is we delivered it about the 15th of March last year. Ah, uh, right. And on the 16th of March, we pretty much locked down. So the 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 project's still sitting there. The, the, the council didn't quite get around to issuing all the reports. 
none of the retrofits have yet happened, but it's all just sitting there waiting to, to catalyze again and, and be rolled out. So we're hoping that that'll happen this, this year, maybe, maybe next. Good. So moving on, as, as your slide says, to, to the retrofit problem, take us through that. Yeah, well, that, that's where that's why we joined the the Green Finance Institute as well, because there is a we've been in this sector for about 19 years, and there's always been a problem with finding houses that that need something and identifying specifically what it is, and then funding it. And we constantly meet asset managers that are they're quite focused on doing kitchens and bathrooms and the things people want, and then they react to people screaming, you know, freedom of information requests and disrepair claims. But always on the horizon, there's something changing. There's changes to SAP, there's changes to the eco-funding rules, and it's it's almost beyond the ability of a human to understand how to make a decision with without regret. So, for instance, right now you can get grants to put in gas boilers, but when SAP changes, which is supposed to be June 22, your uh, SAP score will go down mm. because they now recognise within SAP that electricity is now generated much more carbon neutral than gas. So you, you can take grant funding today, which is right, you know, the grant funding's there, but the, the, the downside of that is in June, you'll potentially fail the ombudsman's inspection of your homes. So we're trying to guide clients through it and say, look, don't do this because it's not the right decision today. Why not do something a bit more future proof? But it was all client-led, Andrew. It was all we, we did a project with Aberdeen Council, Crikey, back in about 2003. We did about 5,000 thermal image surveys and said to them, "What do you think?" And they were very polite and kind, but ultimately they said they're just pretty pictures. <laughs> and then we went, we, we took that on board, and it, it's true that that is what they are. They're, they're, they do tell a story, but ultimately they're pretty pictures. So we, we went to a venture capitalist and said, look, if we had about half a million pounds, we think we can turn the pixels into pounds and that'll be more meaningful to the, the client base. Uh, they, they believed in that, they invested in that, and we, we wrote algorithms that could quantify a thermal image. And we're still the only guys in the world that can do that. So we did another 15,000 for Aberdeen City Council based on that ability to quantify them. And when we presented that back to them, we said, now what do you think? And we were all quite excited about it, having spent half a million pounds. And what, what they said was, that's much better, but you've just very accurately described that we definitely have a headache. What's the aspirin? So then we went back to our VCs again and said, look, we need to automate this process. There's too many moving parts. It's too fluid. People don't know where the areas of fuel poverty are. They don't know where the gas grid begins and ends. They don't know what legislation is coming, and it's too fluid. So we, we raised another half million pounds, and we basically tried to automate the process. So we're at a point now where we can take in mass amounts of data. We can sanity check it, augment it, curate it, aggregate it, run it through today's funding landscape, today's SAP criteria. We can model all on Google Earth, Google Streets. And we got it to a point where you can simply draw a polygon on a map, which is what you're seeing in the bottom left of your screen. And as soon as that polygon closes, it tells you how much funding is available for those houses, how many um, houses there are, what the condition is, what the EPC rating is, and fundamentally, what the net zero roadmap is for each house. And, and it looks like that. We've got about 400,000 uh, houses on the platform. Um, there's actually way more than that. There's about 18 million because we've mapped all the EPC register. Okay. But we, we cut it down to 400,000 for demonstration purposes because it, it runs really slowly with 18 million, <laughs> as you can imagine. But it does give you that ability to, to pull anything you want from it. You can say, look, show me all my properties that are below a C, that are houses, that are in Fleetwood, that are grant fundable. And it's that data just at your fingertips that's really, really powerful. And it's giving people a, look, show me where my CO2, where's the, the most dense CO2 output I have and what house type is it? And that's what we're working with the, the GFI to try and deploy funding optimally so we don't waste it. 
And, and I mean, you've alluded to a, a number of data sets that you've pulled together, but uh, in addition to things like EPC, what, what kind of data sets have you pulled in uh, and what were the challenges? Because clearly joining together these islands of data is one of the big challenges in the built environment. So what sort of things have you been able to, to pull in and join up, if I can use a very low tech phrase, and, and what have been those challenges about getting these various data sets together? Well, that, that's a very good question, Andrew. The, the, the data is the most fundamental, hardest thing we ever have with clients. Um, we, we usually get an asset register and CSV output. So most of our clients tend to have some, some method of monitoring their assets, and usually they have more than one. So some people have got everything on something like Keystone or Northgate or a codeman and we just ask them look can you just go to the top left click file export csv and send it to us and then we mash that with the epc register with information from royal mail from energy saving trust and put it all together and then we flag up the discrepancies because we've yet to find a client that's got perfect data mm. uh, we've also developed about 250 uh, dynamic templates so if Sometimes, Andrew, we get a client that says, look, all I've got is the address, mm. help. And other clients have got 200 fields. And there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to the guy, the chap that's got 200 fields, half of them can be wrong. You know, column, column J can say they're on gas and column M can say they're on electricity. And fundamentally, those, those create two completely different outputs. So we have to understand that need, we have to sanity check that data right from the get-go, uh, which is quite tricky. And then what we do once we've got all the data in one place and we have mashed it together, is we physically go to site with a thermal image to say, look, all the data says that that cavity has been filled, the EPC says it's been filled, but let's go and, let's go and take a yeah. sample 10%. And then we take a thermal image like the one on your screen now and find out it's a half-filled cavity. Yeah. All those red pixels, green's good. Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, I, I suppose that, that that does bring up that that interesting and, and slightly worrying point about that whole kind of performance gap issue. I mean, what what's your sense of the that gap in in, in the real world between between ratings and actual performance? I mean, are, are we living in a slightly I state to, to use the phrase, but I will say this kind of fool's paradise where we think we have so much of the stock performing at a certain level because of a, uh, an existing EPC. Is the performance gap as, as big as some people think between what's really happening and, and the various certifications that, that people have? Yeah, Andrew, when, when I was in architecture, I, I used to think that because I wrote, make this building out of King's <laughs> whatever that's happened and then when i was in specification sales on the flat roofing side i realized that convincing an architect to specify a product was only the beginning mm. of the journey to make sure that what's on the drawing is what arrives on site even with, you know with contractors and subcontractors and qs's there's a myriad of ways things get changed our, our real world experience if you look at insulation on on houses of the 350,000 houses we've physically surveyed, we found a third of them had no insulation. We found a third of them were well insulated and a third were badly insulated. Mm -hmm. So of, of the two thirds that were insulated, 50% of them weren't what they said they should be. Um, so, so that, yeah. That's, that's mm -hmm. the irony is that, is that it's, it's that gray area of, of, of where you think something has been done, but actually it's that quality that hasn't happened, that, that, that either through dare I say it, poor workmanship or just not using the right materials where there's almost that we think they should be doing X but actually the real challenge is that hasn't been properly implemented and I guess that's one of the challenges of the whole retrofit agenda is that kind of quality of work and then that ongoing measurement in some way to understand that are we actually because as you say I forget how many billions of pounds might be involved but you know a lot of money could be spent arguably and, and, and not deliver the results. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. And that, that's what we need to avoid this time round, because there's been a lot of money spent, a lot of taxpayers' money spent on initiatives like ECO and the predecessor EEC, all spent with the best intentions. Mm. But the minute there's a lot of money to be made, it, it sometimes it brings out the worst in people and they, they cut corners. The, the trick for the RICS surveyor is that image on your screen, if you had a drill gun with you and you drilled at waist level, and you took three or four boroscope samples, 
you would report back and say, yeah, it's full of insulation. Yeah, it's, it's okay. So that, that's what excites me about the thermal imaging is you get this picture and you say, look, we're not trying to sell you anything. There's no insulation involved, but I know why your house is cold upstairs. You know, it's a really simple uh, test and it does give you that whole picture. And then that, that, that screen, the image that's on your screen now, that's literally before and after. House on the left has been insulated, house on the right hasn't. The, the black circles are satellite dishes, the black stripe down the middle is a rainwater pipe. The little hot spot on the top left house is a bird's nest. <laughs> but it's, it's just a really compelling way to say, look, if you insulate your house, you'll save £347 a year, you'll contribute 3.6 tonnes less CO2 to the environment, and you'll save 18,000 kilowatts. It's a really simple way to do that. Would you yeah, like tell to tell us about Project Doric? Well, I was just about to ask if you wanted me to tell you about this one. <laughs> this, the, the culmination of everything we've been doing has, is bearing fruit on the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund project we won in Aberdeen. So Doric is the, the dialect of the northeast of Scotland. They, right. they have a, this is a bit of a tangent, but they have a beautiful saying, <laughs> Doric. <laughs> That doesn't really translate, but they, they say fit, fit, bit, fits, fit, fit. And in Doric, and anyone listening who is an Aberdonian knows, I just said, which boot fits which foot? <laughs> <laughs> Doric, it all sounds like fit. Anyway, in this instance, it stands for the Domestic Optimised Retrofit Innovation Concept. All right. But we could use Doric to, to fit, the, to give it roots in Aberdeen. But we, we pulled, forward a, uh, pulled together a consortium with all the partners at the bottom there. Um, and we put Aberdeen's entire portfolio is 22,000 houses. So we've analysed all of them against today's investment uh, criteria. We identified 500 houses that met everyone's objective. So Robertson Construction wanted them to be really dense because that made more sense. They didn't have to set up multiple sites. Yeah. Uh, they had one, one port of cabin sort of thing. Um, SMS are a large and um, smart metering PV and battery installer. They're a huge, huge PLC with a, a couple of thousand staff. They also brought in two and a half million pounds worth of funding to the project. So they fund matched everything from Bayes, so quite, quite an, an important partner in the process. Um, but they needed south facing elevations, they needed two or three bedroom houses. But then Aberdeen Council themselves had, we're really keen on these houses. And then we had to look at things like asbestos, we had to look at residents' engagement. So we, we kept whittling it down to say, look, there's 22,000 in the data, there's 500 that meet everyone's criteria. Weed out some that through discussion, you know, became uh, unsuitable for one reason or another. Then write to those 250 people and say, we'd like to spend 55,000 pounds improving your house. We're going to do a fabric first retrofit, then we're going to add PV and batteries. Would you like it? Uh, and 150 people came back and said, yes, please. Mm -hmm. 100 either didn't want it or didn't uh, didn't respond. So then we, we went to site and did more what an RICS surveyor would do. We did proper um, EPCs. Yeah. We did assessment. We did uh, more involved thermal imaging surveys. Then we whittled that down to archetypes and got super involved. Uh, so they, they became had daytime, nighttime, internal and external thermal images, then the pressure tests, and then to be able to super accurately um, quantify the, the thermal images, we applied our G-Skin. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're a little device that's about the size of a postage stamp connected with a thin wire to something about the size of a matchbox. Mm. You leave it in situ for 72 hours and it works out the absolute U-value of the fabric. All right, okay. And then you can apply it to, to the whole project and say, look, we know the absolute U value. Now we're, we're on site right now, physically bolting things into those buildings. Uh, and then once everything's done, we're physically um, surveying everything again, just to make sure everything's uh, aligns and, and, and meets objectives that it's supposed to. But it's good fun. It's a big, big, big project. Very important. Well, I, one I, I, I guess the, the question that, that I always think about when, when we talk about this whole retrofit um, challenge for the UK is, is 
and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this challenge, is, is how do we scale up to the challenge? Because this is just such a um, an eye-watering number of dwellings that, 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 that needs to be addressed. And as you say, some are sitting in private rented sector, you know, obviously some in, in social housing, and obviously a lot of owner occupied is. What are your thoughts on that challenge of, of the scale up? How do, is it a bottom up process with lots of local authorities and different stakeholders working bottom up? Uh, and how is that matched by the kind of top down approach either through, um, you know, obviously the, the Scottish administration, the UK, the, the devolved nations. What what are your views on, on how the market and governments and other actors can actually make this happen on the scale that needs to needs to happen okay, how, how long is this uh, vodcast how long do you have <laughs> <laughs> what i would love to see i would love to see just a whole house fabric first retrofit rolled out like a like a cookie cutter if we could yeah. say look, if you live in a two bedroom semi detached in bradford with a gas boiler here's the process here's a, a simple step by step way of doing it um but there's so many players, it's going to have to be a blend of carrot and stick as well. The, the, the tricky bit we, we always find is, is, is humans. You know, you, you could say to someone, look, buy this PV and battery, it's going to cost you £8,000, but you'll save £65 a month. The average person in the UK has £93 in the bank. Mm. That, that's the, the genuine life savings of the average UK person. So the, there has to be a mechanism in place where it's it's heavily subsidised. Yeah. And the, we, we get strange experiences, Andrew. We get people, super grateful people who said things like, look, you've saved me £6.50 a week or a day because of this fabric first. And they're almost in tears because that means they can afford to eat at the weekend. Mm. Those people are, are super happy to have a retrofit. And equally, we've met more wealthy people who've said things like, saving 65 quid, I could just not buy a new mobile phone. Mm. And it's how you how you get those two to, to meet is, is tricky. We just have to make it um, sexier than it is, because insulation is not a sexy thing. No, no I, and I suppose that the, the challenge is is making people care. As you say, you, you know, one of your examples there is somebody who, if I'm very blunt, clearly doesn't care about the bigger issue that that this this saving of money actually represents because obviously that's so many tons of carbon so it's uh, uh and, and i suppose perhaps it's, it's over doing it to talk about the analogy with drink driving but it's almost that societal change about something being made to be feel not acceptable anymore that actually having a house that isn't firmly performing well almost dare I say it shouldn't be considered to be an acceptable thing anymore. It, it should be seen as, as what it is, which is not only wasting money, but actually polluting and, and simply not, not, I suppose in the same way, some, certain countries of, I think Scandinavia, that, that trend towards, dare I say, almost flight shaming, but that, that encouragement to say, well, actually, you know, why are you flying? Why can't you get the train? Why can't you look at other ways of, of doing things? And it's raising a level of awareness, which hopefully is beginning to happen more broadly, but um, making people think that it's ironically not just about the money, that there are bigger issues here for people who perhaps, ironically, for them, money isn't the issue so much. Yeah. I think for, for every commercial person, we have to follow, follow the money. It's, it's a common phrase. So things like house pricing if if you had solar panels if that makes a 10 percent difference to the valuation of your house people would be more excited about it you know that's like putting in a new kitchen or double glazing or a new bathroom or something so that, that will flow through and filter through i'm sure it will what the green finance institute are doing with um, green mortgages and pushing that look if you could get half a percent or, or 0.25 off of your mortgage if you do energy efficient measures that's a big that's a big sea change that's quite exciting um, and that's happening now so we, we are talking to uh, building societies and banks who are talking about how do we how do we enforce it how do we maximize that how do we help our customers access funding and how do we know that they spend it appropriately that they don't just Indeed. spend it on a bike or a holiday or yeah as you say, I mean, it comes back to this kind of due diligence piece, doesn't it, of making sure the money is spent appropriately and the work is, is done well, and that if in terms of that performance gap, the building does actually perform that well. Yeah. And, and that brings us right back to data again. We, we, we've got, um, I mentioned Dave Jones at the, the start of the call. Yeah. Dave Jones raised £112 million 
hired 900 people and spent a decade mapping every building in the world. And it's now available for free on your phone. And what we do with that data is model the energy efficiency. So you, you can get it to a point where you can you can actually use this app as a sat nav in your car for free, drive down the street and see the energy performance of buildings. That now that whether that would make a difference if, if you pulled up outside a house with a wife and kids in tow and said, What do you think of this house, kids? <laughs> it's an aerated. You know, if the gardens are big enough or the shops are too far yeah. away or the school is bad, you know, that, that location, location, location thing, it, it's difficult to get away from. We need to change it from location, location, location to location, location, efficiency and somehow get people to think along those lines. Well, as you say, um, and I suppose it has to be ultimately a, a degree of carrot and stick. There, there has to be hopefully... Um, you know, both that kind of behavioural change uh, sort of encouraged and arguably the cost of funding. And, uh, and as you say, as the market begins to value these kind of quality buildings, that will be reflected in prices. And as you say, it may well be reflected in the cost of finance. So I think there's no silver bullet is there because we're, we're dealing with a population here who have different drivers and different behaviours. And there's going to be no one single kind of thing that will will help. But I think fundamentally, we need the data. We can't make any decisions at all unless we have the data. So what we've discussed this morning is key because we need the data. You know, people can't make decisions for better or for worse unless they have an awareness of how that building is performing and what the implications might be in terms of them spending money or getting grants or deciding whether it is the kind of house they want. Exactly. And that, that's kind of compounded a little bit with GDPR as well, because you can't get your hands on all the data you want. So things like energy consumption data, the utility companies know that, but no one else does. Mm. So if, if you could actually get your hands on the consumption of that red building in the middle of your screen, we could map out everything and say, well, that's why the energy consumption is so high. But my, my, my fear is that they'll just double the price of uh, gas and electricity. And overnight, everyone would be more interested in energy efficiency, but it push so many people into fuel poverty that it would be a disaster. So we, exactly. we're trying, we're trying to get around the GDPR thing by we've, we've created created an app called Hero, which is a an app version of our Dream software for the social housing sector, and this is the housing energy efficiency or retrofit optimizer. But it gets around GDPR by saying, look, that's your house. We've pulled in a picture of your house and the location from where your phone is. Could you confirm that's your house? You do, and it pulls in all your EPC data if it exists. You answer half a dozen questions, you tell us how much you think your house is worth, and it does calculations to say, look, if what you've told me is true, here's what you need to do at your house. And by the way, you can get £7,000 off the grants, but there's a shortfall, Nationwide can provide you with the grant, it's for solar panels and air source heat pump. And then that app, um, it actually connects you to a Trustmark PADS 2035 um, contractor who's local, and you can get reviews from them on the Trustmark website and you can create a, an appointment. But that, the, the trouble for little companies like me is I don't have £30 million to spend on advertising yeah, making people indeed. care of Hero. That's well, th 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 this has been great, Stuart, and, and we've only really, uh, as we discussed, we've only kind of really scratched the surface here. And um, I'm looking forward to talking again because there's so much more we can discuss here. Uh, and as you and I continue to work with the GFI and, and the SEEB initiative, there's mm -hmm. such a huge job here to be done that, that we need to keep talking about this and actually making people more aware of what is already available in terms of data and tech to start solving this. But it is a, it's an awe-inspiring challenge, isn't it? It is. And as long as we're open-minded and we embrace it, Andrew, we can do it. We put man on the moon in 1969. We can do exactly. this. Indeed. Yeah. Well, it's been great to talk and, and I look forward to, to our next discussion. Thanks again, Stuart. Thank you very much, Andrew. Appreciate it.